So John chapter 11. I'm not sure if I've taught on this here, but I have other places. And so with that, I just felt pressed in the spirit after we concluded this morning. I lay down to rest that this is where Yahweh wanted me to go. And so I'm doing that. I'm following that. He put these uh, this chapter in my mind. And we just want to be obedient to that. Getting ready to take a look at John chapter 11. But before we do, let me open up with a word of prayer anyhow, before anything else. Precious Heavenly Father, we give praise, honor, and glory unto you, and we look to you, uh, and we ask and pray that you will just touch us, and guide us, give us the words to speak, and may the words be your words that we speak, and whether it's through song or deed or words or teaching, to help lift up those who are in need, and we just ask this all in Yeshua HaMashiach's precious, holy, mighty name. So it is said, so let it be done. Hallelujah. Uh, Yahweh impressed on my mind to go and take a look at John chapter 11. It is always good to be among brethren. So let us take a look at Yohanan chapter 11. Yohanan chapter 11. Just let me know when you're there. It's kind of a good or kind of a long chapter and one of the longest out of the Bosora, but there are certainly a lot of high points here that we can, I believe, extract from the one teaching we come out of and looking at what, uh, looking a little bit into uh, Sukkot, if what is to come, as well as about, we're all there, let us go. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Miriam, and her sister Martha. It was that Miriam which anointed the master with ointment, and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Master, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Yeshua heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the honor of Elohim, that the Son of Elohim might be honored thereby. Now we see that Yeshua knows what's going on. He's not there, but he's still privy to this information, isn't he? He knows what's going on. He knows that he's sick. He's got a full understanding of what's happening. But he's saying, this that is upon you and upon your brother, it is to glorify, give honor and praise and show the power of Yahweh Elohim. Verse 5. Now Yeshua loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When they heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Now, people got to be thinking to themselves at this point, what is he thinking? And, and Yeshua knew, when we look at this text, he knew Yahweh's time, not man's time. Your timetable doesn't mean anything to Yahweh. He controls time, space, matter, and everything that is intertwined with the three. And with that said, there's nothing that he can't do. But we're stuck in this little circumstance we call time, and we think, you gotta go now, we gotta go now, we gotta go, we gotta go, hurry, hurry, hurry. And we get this mindset that we can do something of our own accord, and right now, no less. But Yahshua is saying, uh-uh, ain't going down like that. Because remember, he and the Father are one. So he's not going to go jumping the gun and getting ahead of the, uh, putting the cart before the, the mule. He knows what's, what's coming down the line. Seven. Then after that, says 
he to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Rabboni, Rabbi, the Jews, the Yehuda, of late sought to stone you, and you go there hither again? <laughs> you know, you might think, hey, gee, this is pretty bold. You say, hey, he's he wants to go back and beg him for problems? No. He knows there's a need and somebody in need and somebody and he's going to be there indeed. A friend in need is a friend indeed, as the old saying goes. And when you're in in the faith and you have the understanding, and we're going to see that these people had that understanding, clearly. We may not think it at this point, and they're going to get the the full spectrum. Yeah, she was going to put things into perspective for them, but they got the faith, and that's the, the, the first key. So the work is that they went out and they set, sent for Yeshua. So he's going to go into Yehuda, and he knows he's going there for a purpose. He's going to be protected. Yeshua answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If any man walk in the day, he stumble not, because he sees the light of this world. Twelve hours of daylight, generally. I had a discussion with somebody who says, and the 12, and the 24 hours in a day from the time period that we count yes but for as far as the daylight is what he was referring to generally about 12 hours in a day and if any man walk in the day he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of the world we know the light of the world is for sure but if a man walk in the night he stumbles because there is no light in him now you say, in him, and he's talking about natural light, but he's got the two intertwined here. They're both intertwined because when people are going to do wicked, dirty deeds, it's going to be 98% of the time at night. They're going to, you know, commit some, some felonies and some B&Es, uh, that's breaking and entering, uh, bank robbery, a heist or something. They're not going to do it when everybody's working the bank. And work in the teller, and when everybody's uh, out and about working, so what they're going to do is they're going to wait into the cloak of night, because men love darkness rather than light, Yeshua says, because their deeds are evil. These things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him out of his sleep. Now right here is a clue on where we're going to be going within the next couple of weeks into the topic of our death and our resurrection. We're going to take a close look at that later. But we're going to see something now that we've alluded to before, is that death is a sleeping process. And we're going to break that down in about two, three weeks. We've got one more teaching before that. And then we're going to see this broken down throughout both covenants it's no you're dead and you're you're floating up and you're getting wings or you're getting your horns and none of that nonsense but he says i go to wake him now you think consider this this one verse he says but i go to wake him now if he's floated on up into the shemaim heaven he's got him some nice halo going and some uh, wings and all, all this uh, figurative uh, garbage that you would see on the Looney Tunes and, and propaganda across time like this. What Yeshua did was he took him out of paradise and brought him back here to this Elohim forsaken hole. You might think, well, if he received his judgment at that time of death, why did he bring him back to only to be judged again? Because it's not. You see how simple that is when you look at this verse in the way that Yeshua talks about it. He wouldn't be just waking him up, bringing him back to life if he was already judged, because judgment day doesn't come every time when you die. Great white throne judgment is proof of that. So with that said, we'll continue on that topic and teaching at a later time. So, he's asleep. The dead, 
but in, in a state of inactivity. The body's breaking down. But who can replace it? Who can heal it and give it life? Only but one. And that is Yahweh, who breathed the Ruach into Hahadam. He gave him the natural life. And he can give life and he can restore life. He can give it and he can take it and he can restore it. Death is not a problem for Yahweh Elohim to manipulate and work around, being that he's the giver of life. Then said his disciples, Master, if he sleeps, shall he shall do well? And how be it, Yahshua spoke of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest and sleep. So we see clearly here that Yeshua knows plainly what's going on. The disciples are still kind of scratching their heads at this point. Like, hmm, they're not quite getting where you're going, what you're doing, and all this. They're just along for the ride. They're kind of like picking up the caboose, and, and Yeshua is the, uh, uh, the, the steam engine. Verse 14. Then said Yahshua unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And listen to this next statement. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent you may believe, nevertheless, let us go unto him. That's kind of a, a, a strong statement. And most people might be a little infuriated with something like that when you say, Hey, I'm glad our friend is dead. Because when when, when you say that, they're still not drawing the concept that he's going to revitalize him. He's going to uh, heal and resurrect him. Only to natural life, though. So that's interesting. But he's saying, I'm glad for your sakes. So he's saying, I'm glad this happened the way that it happened because it had to happen this way because you need to see the power of Yahweh. You need to see the power that Yahweh put and bestowed upon me is what Yeshua is saying. 16. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciple, taught ones, let us also go that we may die with him. They're so sorrowful, they said, just let us lay down and die. Then when Yeshua came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about fifty furlongs off, and many of the Yehuda came to Martha and Miriam to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Yeshua was coming, went and met him, but Miriam sat still in the house. Then Martha said unto Yeshua, Master, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know, even now, whatever you will ask of Elohim, Elohim will give it to you. Now, this is a woman all on her own that's saying, Hey, I know you've got the authority. Whatever you ask, Yahweh will do it for you. It says, even now, I know she can say it. But is she really, are they really getting it? So we're going to see. Are they comprehending? Yeshua said unto her, Your brother shall rise again. And this is the part that we touched on during our uh, three-part teaching of the end times and Yesh of Yeshua's return. 24. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So we see clearly the resurrection happens at the last day. When the last trumpet is blown, Yeshua returns. The resurrection of the just rises up. First the dead that live in Yeshua, and then the living that live in him will be raised to eternal life with him. And she knew this. This wasn't a, a new teaching that come by way of Christianity. In fact, this was from a long, long ago. This was something that come right from the beginning. 
Now, it's clear that she was on the side of the Pharisee teaching, as Yeshua was, and Shaul and others. You may say, well, the scripture doesn't say that. It doesn't say that directly. But if they believed in the resurrection, angels, devils, and all this, they did. Because there was only two groups. There was the Sadducees, who didn't believe in any of it, except for, <laughs> some, give me some money. And then the Pharisees, who believed in angels, devils, uh, the resurrection to come, which is where Shaul, uh, we see his teachings line up with this. So there was two basic mindsets at that time. And now there's <laughs> uh, far, uh, far, far too many more. 26. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. He says, do you believe this? He's putting a question to her. Do you believe this? He says, do you believe this? Her answer, in 27, she says unto him, Yes, Master, I believe that thou art the Messiah, the Son of Elohim, which should come into the world. She had some knowledge. She saw and heard and believed and followed she had an understanding here she had an understanding because you don't just get an understanding without something being revealed you're going to see something you're going to hear something you're going to have a life-changing experience something is going to happen you just don't sit in a dark dark house or dark room and all of a sudden it, it hits you like lightning and say wow i got this thing figured out i've yet to meet a case like that if anybody does please Share it with me. 28. And when she said so, she went her way and called Miriam, her sister, secretly saying, The master has come and calls for you. As soon as she heard that, she rose quickly and came unto him. Now Yeshua was not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. And the Yehuda then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her. When they saw Miriam, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goes unto the grave to weep there. Then, when Miriam was called where Yeshua was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Master, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. She saying, My brother would not have died if you were here. When Yeshua wherefore saw her weeping, and the Yehuda also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Now we can think a lot of things about Yeshua doing miraculous things and stuff, but we can see the the feelings that he possessed. He groaned in the spirit. He was troubled. He was bothered. But let us continue on. And said, Where have you laid him? He said unto him, Master, come and see the shortest verse. Yeshua wept. Plain and simple. Yeshua wept. We see his humanity. We see that he too has feelings. We see that the loss of a loved one is not easy. Sometimes it's easy for people to think, you know, you got a, a, a harsh judge sitting up in the cloud somewhere, you know, bringing judgment and then this and that and things like that but this is not something that Joshua takes lightly certainly when he sees his beloved ones suffering us or Lazarus or anybody in between Lazarus to us or anybody before Lazarus it's not an easy thing for him and we can get an understanding of Yahweh as well through this because the two are one that Yahweh doesn't take pleasure in this. Yahweh doesn't want things to be the way that they are. If he did, he'd leave them alone and just let things go chaotic. But instead, he says that he's rectifying the world unto himself. That's a person that cares, or rather spirit, Ruach. It's a person because it's how you know, people can generally relate. And Yeshua is the personified embodiment of Yahweh. So with that said, we can see they have feelings. We can see that they care. 
If he didn't, he just said, oh, boy, this, this poor sap's had it. Let's go home. But he said he took time and he, he was sad, he wept. He was seeing the Yehuda, who mostly didn't give a hoot about him, but he cared about them. He cared about uh, Miriam and Martha to see that the brother whom Yeshua know, knew grieving. 36. Then said the Yehuda, Behold, he loved him. Now, you can see the Yehuda here at this point. They're starting to say, Hey, you know, all these things, but he's got some feelings. We can see that he can relate to them and he can relate to us. And some of them said, Could not this man have which opened the eyes of the blind have caused even this man should not have died? There's some that were questioning if Yeshua had been there, he wouldn't have died. They said he, he healed the blind, he, he made the lame to walk, he'd he done all these things. Could he have not healed him? And even still, no doubt, he had to have heard these things, these murmurings, either in the ear or by Ruach. And with that, we know that that had to trouble him even more, saying, all this has to happen because these people doubt me, and this has to happen so I can prove who I am, show them my credentials, so to speak, so that they will believe. You see how intertwined that all is? That all this had to happen? Everything that happens has to happen for Yahweh's will to be worked out. Because he had no clergy ID. From Yahweh saying, here's my stamp of approval. It was his works. He says, do not believe what I said. Just believe the very works that I do. And then he still couldn't. But they say, hey, you can give me. You can do for me. Yeshua, therefore, again groaning in himself, comes to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Yeshua said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him, that was dead, that was... Lazarus' sister, said unto him, Master, by this time he stinks, for he has been dead for four days. Now you see an interesting statement that he puts to them. Yeshua said unto her, I said unto you that if you would believe, you would see the majesty of Elohim. Then they took the stone away from the place where the dead was. And Yahshua lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that thou hast heard me. And I know that you hear me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said that they may believe that you have sent me. See that all that had to happen so that really that Yahshua could show his, his green card. and. It was it was really a matter of getting them to believe who he was. The Father sent me. They don't want to see the way that they wanted to see because the, the Messiah that they had cultivated in their own minds was not the Messiah that is. And they had a problem dealing with that, that conflict. They had age-old tradition that said, he's going to fall down out of the sky and he's going to rule with an iron fist. He's going to kick these jamokes right out of here, wipe them right out, and it's done. And you had another group that said, he's going to be come out of a woman, and he's going to conquer and divide and conquer and rule. And it wasn't like that. It was somewhere in the middle, at least for a time, and they, they didn't want to see it like that. He was setting up his kingdom, and his kingdom needed followers. His kingdom needed followers and the kingdom that he is setting up currently is not a in a castle it's in a, a spiritual realm in a manner of speaking but it's also a physical realm because wherever his elect are there the Ruach will be the Ruach HaKadosh so all this again had to happen because he needed to prove that the father sent him 43, John eleven forty three, And when they heard, and when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. 
come hither. Now suppose if he just spoke in a loud voice, and all them bodies got up out of the ground, could be a uh, could be problematic. But he used his name, and again, names are important. Names are key. Because if he didn't, like I said, highly likely that all the saints in that area may have come up. And I say saints loosely, the Kodashim. For those who may not know, that's what Kodashim means. But anyhow, verse 44. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Yeshua said unto him, Loosen him, let him go. Yeshua didn't even touch him. Take notice to that. He just spoke, and he came to life. It was others that helped him out of those grave clothes. So you got a, a little glimpse of he's still staying clean. It was his words that brought him back to life. 45. Then many of the Yehuda which came to Miriam and had seen the things which Yeshua did, believed on him. Now we're going to see things happen. Things are shaken now because you just don't wake up somebody from four days of being dead, stinking, stinking to high heaven, and that just does not go undetected. People can say what they want, scam about being blind or lame or anything else, lepers, but this, this trumped everything at this point. At this very moment, this was the, the, the cherry on top of the the uh, hot fudge ice cream it really uh dominated everything that would that yeshua had done prior and it was a wake-up call for the nation to say <laughs> wait a minute so they said that many of the yehuda which came to mary and had seen the things which yeshua did believed on him but some of them went their ways to the Pharisees, and told them what things Yeshua had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council, and said, What do we? Say, what do we do? For this man does many miracles. Ain't just a few anymore. You can't just write this off and say, uh, This was some old stick in the mud. You're not writing this one off. Many had seen this. Many Yehuda seen it. Family, friends, neighbors, many a people seen, documented, and knew that he was dead for four days. When you're seeing it, you're there. I mean, that's well documented within the people. It may not be necessarily documented as we have it today with death certificates and all that, but documented as well as, hey, I seen it, you're dead. So when you when I say documented, that's how I mean it. It's a verbal documentation. Everybody sees it, they hear it, they acknowledge it. Now, others are acknowledging it, but not in such good ways. So they say, for this man does many miracles. If we let him alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Again, Yeshua wasn't come to conquer and divide as we, or they, understood it to be and wanted it to be. Now they're saying, hey, this guy can do a lot of miracles here. we got to do something about this. Rome's got the control. Now, he just conquered death. Man was dead for four days. Wouldn't that kind of clue you in to, would Rome really be that much of a problem? I mean. Think about it. Somebody can raise the dead. Are you going to really be concerned with somebody that's got an army? I mean, seriously? Kill y'all? Bring y'all back to life and kill them? Hmm? I'm just saying it's a possibility. Could have could have went that way if, uh, if, if their line of thinking was like that. But it wasn't. Their thinking was marred. Their thinking was everything off Kelter. And they had no faith. And that's why they didn't they didn't think, hey, Rome's not going to be a problem. This guy can raise the dead. Hm, he can raise our nation up, which is dead. No, no, they weren't thinking that. They were thinking, we got to do something. 
Again, where's Yahweh in the midst of this? Where's Yahweh in the midst of this? Where's their faith? Rome's got the yoke on us. Rome controls us. Where's their faith that Yahweh would liberate them? But again, you know, another point to this verse, he says, all men believe. If we leave him alone, all men believe. That would be a serious problem because if everybody in that nation believed and then they overturned Rome, they took full control of the, the Holy Land at that point of time, think of how it would have differed to all the nations believing and many horrific events would not have happened if 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 these pharisees and, and these councils had faith the very faith that they were teaching they were just going to run amok they were doing the same old same old this is what we're taught to do this is the time for the sacrifice this is what we do this is what we do and there's no faith it just becomes you're, you're spinning your tires in the mud you're not going anywhere but we still got to do it. We still got to spend them tires, although they're not going anywhere. So they took it amongst themselves to say, hey, we got to put a kibosh to this guy. We got to we'll put a stop to him and throw a monkey wrench in his program because, hey, this is going to mean our money, our livelihoods, and everything else are at stake. If all follow him, what need you of councils, Pharisees, Sadducees? high priests, all that would have changed. But it was because Yehuda had no faith. Or, in a nutshell, the majority of them had very little. And these people, you can clearly see, had none. As far as I read the text, and what Yahweh showed me, these people here in these councils, their only faith was in themselves. Let us save ourselves. 49. And one of them named Caiaphas, being high priest, the same year said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and the whole, then the whole, and that the whole nation should perish not. He just fulfilled prophecy that it was that one should die for the nation. They thought that if they let him go, their livelihood's gone. Their way of life is gone, and their nation is gone. Now, where was their faith in Yahweh? Clearly, he did many, many miracles of that, that were beyond the scope of hoaxing, beyond the scope of uh, just, oh, this is just by chance. He just has a little, little something going for him. He outdid every prophet that ever came before him or after. Wouldn't that be a clue to them that knew the Torah, that knew the the uh, the writings, and the, the prophets and the Psalms? Wouldn't that have been a clue to them? Likewise, we can take that same clue and point it in our direction, point the finger at us and say, hey, let us take a look at ourselves and make sure, can, is Yahweh here? Am I allowing him to help me to overcome the divorce or the separated or some sort of problems with family or friends or loved ones or something. And these problems, consider, can he not restore and rejuvenate new life to that and help you overcome? Only if you look and ask and seek earnestly with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. In this spoke he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Yeshua should die for that nation. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of Elohim that were scattered abroad. Talking about getting everybody together. Let them, let them see this. We want this documented. We want to make an example here. Then from that day forth, they took counsel together to put him to death, to put Yahshua to death. And you gotta say, aren't these people just slap crazy? All he did was resurrect a guy that'd been dead for four days. You think you'd be happy about the entire thing. You'd think that somebody would be and should be happy about the entire situation, but instead they're looking off the guy. 
I mean, that's gratitude for you, huh? And he restores somebody to life, and, and they're looking to take his. Now, wouldn't that have scared you to think, well, if he raised somebody else from the dead, couldn't he not do that for himself? I mean, that's the way I would think. I would be, uh, I wouldn't be privy to, to any of that. Because if he can do that for somebody else, why couldn't he for himself? Now, why would you want to go up against that kind of power? That's the kind of power that only comes from Yahweh Elohim. 54. Yeshua therefore walked up no more openly among the Yehuda, but went, went into a country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his taught ones. And the Yehuda, Yehuda's Passover is actually, or Yahweh's Passover, was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Pesach to purify themselves. You see, purification was still in order. And Yeshua followed that, as we should as well. 56. Then taught they for Yeshua and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What think you that he will not come to the feast? The feast of Pesach. says they're talking amongst themselves, saying, you think he's going to come? You think he was going to be here? Now both the chief priests of the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it that they might take him. And because of that, they sought to put Yeshua to death. They sought to put him to death because of only the mere sake that he raised somebody to life. This was a threat to their way of life. This wasn't what they wanted. This wasn't the kind of Messiah that they wanted. They didn't want to see about people being raised from the dead. They wanted to see people dying. And how distressing is that? And I believe that, that this text gives us a warning for ourselves to take heed. Make sure who you're looking for and look into to overcome, to help overcome all things, to have the strength to be able to be wise enough to look to Yahweh and to give him praise, honor, and glory, just as Yeshua did. As Yeshua clearly said, he was thanking the Father, and we ought to do the same ourselves. But to be mindful that no matter what the situation is, if he can restore somebody to life, and pick up his own life, and create the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything that is in them, how much bigger or smaller are our problems? When you think, I look up at, the, up at the, the sky often, and I think just from what I can see is a vast, vast distance. And I remind myself frequently, the heavens of heavens cannot contain Yahweh. Space and the universe cannot contain Him. So how much more are my problems? How bigger are they? They become pretty small. There was a, uh, a, a little song that... Uh, I think it was that woman, I can't remember her name, that she did that talk show with, uh, I can't remember what his name was now, Regis or something like that, I guess. And she did a, a little theme song for uh, a Bible cartoon that children have. It was about David and Goliath. And it says, talking about big problems, you know, it says how my problems start looking pretty small next to a, well, Elohim like you. And that's where we need to remind ourselves that always, always, always and constantly, no matter what the situation is, He can overcome. He can help us to overcome. He can give us the power, the wisdom, the knowledge, the discernment, the understanding. There's, there's a way if we look and seek. Seek Him first. Seek you out of the book. You need to seek Him out of the scripture. And through that and with that, I believe there's nothing that can't be healed, done. It says all <laughs> things are possible to Yeshua who hmm, strengthens us. And Yeshua is the key to Yahweh. And so I'll we'll just leave you with that. And uh, just keep in mind, we, uh, we want to be the Lazarus ourselves. We want to be restored but to eternal life. We want to be the ones that come up on the last day in the resurrection we hear that trumpet 
that last call coming up out of that ground and i'm sure the first thing i'd be saying is hallelujah i'd be saying praise be unto yahweh elohim no more suffering and no more going through what we need to go through now to be done and i like that in revelation when the heavenly yeshua says it is done it says i am the aleph and ta the beginning and the end the first and the last so i just wanted to try to uh present this as Yahweh had uh, shown me there this evening. So anyway, shalom, shalom.